from home. It's a long way. A long way. Slave master, I wanna go home. I wanna go home. Ag, street dedication is where I started me and my brothers. Street dedication, gotta shout out all the black mothers. Street dedication is where I started me and my sisters. Street dedication. Gotta shout out all the black father. I want to welcome you all here. If you've not been here to High School Green Youth Club, welcome to this space. Um, if you haven't, if you haven't come and, and, and met any of the folks at the RCG, then you all have opportunity to, to, to actually see and find out a little bit what they do uh, here um, this evening. So my name's Rob G and I'm from a group called Nottingham City Monitor. We set ourselves up in 2011 as a response to uh, the uprisings which took place here in Nottingham at the time. And we do a range of work from stop and search to anti-police to death in custody. Um, most of the things which affect several of us in the community which we live here in Nottingham. I wanted to, I'm lucky enough to share this platform this evening with Bob Brown and Bob is a key organiser in the All African People's Revolutionary Party, Guinea Canapri and Bob was also um, a founding member of the Black Panther Party Chicago chapter and he's here to share some of his experiences from his organising with a focus more particularly on the, some of the events which happened in Africa. Uh, Bob's just coming back from the No to War, No to NATO uh, conversions in, um, in, in Brussels uh, the, in, in December and he's hoping to share some of his experiences from that and actually look at the, some of the issues around the roots of war in Africa. Um, so Bob will be speaking first. I've also shared the platform with uh, Brother Omawali Rupert from the Pan-African so Society and Community Forum. And he's the founder and the secretary of that group. And he'll be, sh he'll be sharing uh, some insights into the uh, British state and the, in particular the drug trade and how it's targeted Africans here in, here in the UK. Um, and finally but not least is uh, Seamus from the Revolutionary Communist Group who is going to be talking um, and the RCG is an anti-imperialist communist group which fights to build an independent working class um, and it works in solidarity in struggles with the US worldwide so he'll be sharing some insights into how do we organise to try and resist racism and poverty from the lessons from the Black Panther Party. Okay. That's what we're saying. Okay. So, without further ado, I'm going to. The program is going to be. Um, Bob will speak. We will have a short question and answer, and then I'll invite Brother Wally to speak and a short question and answer, and then Chairman Swatchy speaking. And once we got through that, then we're going to have a wider, hopefully more dynamic kind of conversation as a group about some of the issues which we're facing here. Okay. Thank you. We want to thank you for inviting us here. We suggest that it is an act of humanity, an act of culture, an act of kindness. Kwame Ture, whom you perhaps know as Dr. Conmichael, Never tired of saying that the greatest crime that anyone could commit is the crime of being ungrateful. There will be disagreement tonight. We will struggle, struggle, struggle to not be disagreeable. <coughs> Please do not take disagreement as personal or organizational attack. We should be above that by now. This is not kindergarten. It's not about who loves who or who does not like who. It's about struggling for the truth, struggling for direction. 
Rob has promised to chair the meeting firmly. Because I assure you, I'll still be speaking when the lambs come home. And my record is 17 hours with no water and no bathroom stop. <laughs> Obviously, that was when I was younger and confused and thought I was Fidel Castro. <laughs> but we can move on. We are on a tour, a European tour and perhaps a North American one. We helped found in 19, in, I'm sorry, 2008, a group called No to War, No to Nature. 250, no, 650 organizations in 30 countries in that network, and we are the only one of color that I'm aware of. No, that's not true. There may have three or four in different countries in Africa. We found it, but we honestly have not participated in it. One, because we just don't have the money to fly back and forth to Brussels and debate the new Cold War. You know, and the only debates that we debated 50 years ago in our youth, they've been answered as far as we're concerned. And some of them we need to revisit. We also just, there's a history of racism, institutional racism within inside of the peace movement. And we would white, we would add a little bit of white arrogancy and whatnot. And we just don't want to sit up and debate slogans. You know, bring the boys home. We told SWP 50 years ago, America's not our home. Not our home. We told the war resistance meeting 50 years ago, you know, peace. Yes, we want peace. But we want victory to the Vietnamese. We want victory to the Vietnamese. And we had those ideological struggles, those philosophical struggles, and struggles around slogans. And we just got in 68 and kind of tired. And we're not passing out nobody else a leaflet. I mean, if you write the leaflet, you pass it out. If we have a, a participation in the writing of the leaflet, then we will, to our capacity, help pass it out. If we don't participate in the making of the menu, don't even invite us to eat. And we're damn sure we're not going to wash dishes and move chairs and haul garbage out to the den. We come as equals. We are not empty vessels waiting to be filled. You know, our cup is running over. We're not merely beasts of burden who have the agency to haul goods and services. We are human beings who also have the capacity to think, to create culture, ideas, and to create our own <coughs> contribution, our own contribution to illogical struggles throughout the world. We went to this meeting, we are supposed to be planning a international week of actions sometime in May or June when the NATO headquarters is the ribbon will be cut. A $750 million building which shows you, shows you the new coming Cold War, the new coming perhaps hot war. You don't put $750 million into a building and then talk about closing up shop the next day. It's a new phase, a new war being planned. Not so much new, but to escalate the ongoing war. And they say they're going to shut Brussels down. They say they're going to do it. And we believe that they certainly have more capacity to do that here than in the United States. They've called for an international week of action. And we do not mystify, nor do we exaggerate our capacity. We are very, very small. We are very, very poor. We are very, very weak. But we will do what our can, we can, to, as the All African People of the Western Party, GC, to make our contribution to this international action. We came to Brussels, but we just said, we, we were last year, I think, in England in 2014. And we've been coming back and forth since at least 84, 85. We said it makes no sense. It makes no sense to give Air France and Delta Airlines $1,000 and 
and just go to Brussels for a seven hour leave and come back across the water. We said and it's a bare minimum. We need to visit the various African communities and the various African leadership who we sometimes had more than 50 years of relationships with. We need to see if they still exist and see if they still claim to be progressive and revolutionary. If they don't, we dump them. Because our plate is filled. Our plate is filled. So we come to realign, reassess, and rebuild old relationships. But more importantly, we come to build new ones. We requested meetings and events with and hosted by leftists, socialists, communist groups in every country we go to. We're not always happy with the mix that we get. I mean, people are trying to deliver us to the social democratic elite of Europe. I get these emails every day. We're going to see the Prime Minister of Sweden. For what? For what? We're going to meet these people here. For what? For what? But, you know, we're trying to be respectful. We're rebuilding our network and our party, so we're open to at least a meeting, open at least to a conversation. But if the conversation don't moves forward, we move it on. Because we will not be hostage to reaction and counter-revolution, no matter what the names. We don't give a damn about power, because we don't have none. The power of the bourgeoisie, the power of the aristocracy, the power of the capitalist class. We have no need to walk in the palace. And they better not be in the palace to make the palace falls. And the palace will fall. Perhaps not in my lifetime, but it will come. We basically ask to meet the revolutionary communist group. We don't so much know about it. We don't we know very little about it. We just ask to meet with the most progressive, the most leftist forces in Nottingham. And we're still looking for Robin Hood, Mary Marion, and Sherwood Forest. That's the first thing we asked when we got out at Red Castle. Because we were compelled, we were forced in English literature and English history. We, they taught us nothing about Africa. But we know some of the myths, some of the myths of this area of the world. So we came to meet with y'all. It was a general request that we made with Omawali and the Pan-African Society Community Forum when they agreed to host this leg of the tour, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. If things work out, we'll go into Portugal, Spain, France, Germany, Stockholm, Sweden, Switzerland, and uh, one, one or two more before we return. And if Legs hold out and things hold out. We'll simply get on the Greyhound bus and the Mega bus and we will travel city by city by city by city as much as we can until May after Liberation Day, May, June for the no to NATO action. We have very basic assignments meet y'all, talk with y'all, we'll sit till the sun rises, you know. Because we came to do work, we came to meet you. We also came to beg you, 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 beg you to consider the possibility of doing something if, if and when the no NATO actions are announced. When the Italians and the Macedonians are duking it out on the email with the Greeks over whether or not we should, you know, protest against Trump, and we told them, they might have been telling us who's protest against. <coughs> they, they, their position is that, you know, we should not disrupt the love affair between Putin and Trump. We told them, take it to the hotel room. Because Trump ain't going to, Putin ain't going to tell us what to do. And Trump ain't going to tell us what to do. We will pick it, Trump, in the morning. We will pick it, Hillary Clinton, in the afternoon. And if Putin thinks we pack more, we'll pick it his behind in the afternoon in the evening. Nobody will determine for us who our enemy is. Let's shotgun it. Yeah, and Rob has promised to you know, chat this one real firmly. We have essentially two topics which you know it's impossible to do either one of them service in this amount of time. 
one, the African roots of war, and two, I'm sure you came to hear something about the Panther Party. <clears throat> we'll try to do as quick as we can. We'll sit down when he tells us to sit down, and we'll then open it up to questions and answers, and there may be some after discussion. Africa has been at war. Africa has been at war since 3200 BC. When the ancient Egyptian gnomes were united, and some call it Egypt, and some call it Kemet. You do not build 100,000 person armies unless you build, unless you, you know, unless you want war. You do not build armies unless you turn the armies on the people inside the country or your so called enemies abroad. And we have fierce discussions with cultural nationalists who just believe that Africa defies history of humanity, that it def defies the logic of dialectic. But we've been at war since 3200 BC. Dr. W.B. Du Bois wrote an article in 1915 called The African Roots of War, published in the Atlantic Monthly Magazine. Go on and Google it. Just say Du Bois and African Roots of War and you'll put it up. This is two years or one year or so before World War I. And he raised two fundamental questions. Talk of war. Talk about war. And Africa ain't even mentioned. It's like we do not exist. He goes on to say that every civilization, every crisis, every religion has been fought out in or over the question of Africa, from Greece to Great Britain. You know, all the monotheistic religions have had their major crises and or their major moves forward. You know, in Africa, in Africa, yet people don't even mention Africa. We raised the question at the Notre NATO meeting, yes, we come to protect Europe. Yes, we come to help protect Europe. One of the last things Obama did was send 3,200 tanks to the Russian border. He, he released, he, he unleashed the nuclear arms race once again. And we, because of humanity, have an obligation to help protect Europe. If no other than, and we tell the nationalist folks who don't like white folks, well, you have an obligation to protect African people who live in Europe. They're five, ten million, so you don't, 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 don't use excuses. You, know, you have an obligation to be concerned about the drums of war that are beating once again inside of Europe. Because Europe fought each other, or oh, they fought each other. Read military history of Europe. The military history of every country. That's, that's one of my new assignments. You know, just read Wikipedia. You know, just type in military history and just start reading. And we're not arguing that it's all correct, but it's a quick, fast, and dirty way to start the outline and then move to the rest of the literature. We have an obligation. But we told them we didn't come to Europe just to protect Europe. NATO bombed Libya. NATO is bombing Somalia. NATO is, all, it, it is responsible for Iraq, for the carnage in Afghanistan, for Syria. We are anti-NATO because of the threat it poses to Europe, but we are also anti-NATO for the threat that it poses to Africa. We can't go into the details in this fast amount of time. We are also concerned about U.S. Africa. We are slaves. We have been enslaved in Africa since the British came in 1619 and before them the Spanish came in the 1500s. And the French, the Dutch, the Swedes, you know, we, we know our history. And we are still enslaved in the United States. And we could not just, as conscious people, as political people, as revolutionaries, we must condemn that government, not our government, that government. Barack Obama didn't represent us. Hillary Clinton is incapable of representing us, and neither does Trump. You know, we tell Je Jesse Jackson's people, we tell Louis Farrakhan's people, we do not vote for lesser of evils, we do not vote for lesser of devils, and we do not vote for lesser of gods. Lesser is not in our vote.
vocabulary. If you do not represent the people, we have nothing to do with you. Period. End of question. We cannot come here and not talk about Guantanamo. There was a meeting of the National Network on Cuba about two months ago in Chicago. One of the members of our party is the number three person. You know, he's one of the three coordinators, co-coordinators of the National Network on Cuba in the United States. And we had problems. One, because a faction of them were talking about normalization of relationships with Trump. We talk, it's, war is not normal. War is not normal. There's nothing normal about it. And yes, the struggle is at some point to normalize our situation. But we ain't meeting with no Republicans. You know, we have nothing to ask Trump for. You go do that. We will go do something else. We want U.S. out of Guantanamo. U.S. out of Guantanamo because it's, it's the Indians' land. And the little village up the street, Barakua, is the first place that Africans were enslaved in Cuba. And the archdiocese of Barakua in Puerto Rico were the first Catholic archdiocese in that area and the Archdiocese of Boracua at one point controlled the Archdiocese of Chicago. One of the things we're trying to do is to take a hundred gangsters, reformed gangsters, to Boracua and to Guantanamo because we believe that the youth in Chirac, that's what we call it, you know, more violent than Iraq, we believe that the youth of Chirac must play a role in helping get the U.S. Army out of Chicago, the police out of Chicago and get them out of Cuba. Last on that one, we also support the movement in Dublin, at Shannon Airport. They have, they have programs uh, every second Sunday of the month for years. And they're doing a major action in Shannon, Ireland on March 5th because 2.6 million U.S. soldiers try and ship from Shannon on their way to war and on their way from war. And we need to have a presence just to tell some of them Africans who might be part of that, born in the U.S., you shouldn't go. Hell no, we didn't go to Vietnam, and no, you should not go and kill somebody who never called us a nigger. That's right. That's all we have to say. Shotgun to the Panther Party. How much time I got left? Very good. Ten minutes. Okay. We're rolling to the Panther Party. That's ten minutes. Including questions? No, it's your ten minutes. Okay. We roll to the Panther Party. I've been very fortunate in my life. Kwame Nkrumah. I'm an Nkrumah race, ideologically speaking. Kwame Nkrumah suggests that his 11 years he spent in the United States working on his master's degree in philosophy and theology and whatever else. You know, he just studied everything he could, trying to get every piece of paper he could. He said those 11 years were very critical to the awakening of his philosophical conscience. You know, when he went to the United States in 1935, he was 33 years old. He was 33 years old. So what he was basically saying was that his philosophical conscience was awakened when he was 33 years old. He said he read all of what we call the dead white men in philosophy. You know, the dead, Aristotle, you know, you can go on and on and on. And I read some of them people too in high school. He said he was also introduced to what he called the combative philosophies, Marx and Lenin. And he found much more to deal with his situation. He found them much more you know, usable and workable with respect to his colonial situation. He was born in 1902. He was, his political consciousness was awakened in 1935, between 35 and 45, you know, the, the 10, 11 years he spent there. <coughs> well, a man named Kwame Ture started to call Michael. His philosophical consciousness was awakened at nine years old. When he walked into a polling space in Port of Spain, Trinidad, on, on I almost called the street. Getting old is something else. Anyway, I had a, the, the, 
leave it alone. I'll tell you in a minute. And he wanted to vote for a man named Uriah Butler. Uriah Butler had founded the Oil Field Workers Union and was thrown in prison. And Britain would have froze to death. The Spitfires never would have flown had it not been for Trinidad, in World War I and World War II, had it not been for Trinidad and Venezuelan oil. You need to read your history. Uriah Butler organized the oil field workers <coughs> union. He wound up going to jail for a labor strike. He spent a couple of years in jail by the time he, and he worked with the Indians in Trinidad to found the sugar workers union. And he built a party called the Empire Citizens and Home Rule Party. One of the first, if not the first, all black or overwhelmingly majority black political parties in Trinidad. And they tossed him in jail. When he got out of jail in 1939, war had started. And Britain banned him from the oil field, banned him from his own party, and put him back in jail. And he spent 1939 to 1945 in the prisons, British prisons. Kwame Ture, who was a British subject, and I know some of y'all think he's an American, he never did. When he was born, for the first 11 years of his life, he carried up, when he came to the United States, he had a passport that said, Stokely Standard for Churchill. Carmichael. Now you know Carmichael didn't come from Africa and you know where Churchill came from. There are a bunch of men running around the Caribbean <coughs> who were named after Western Churchill. Just as it gets sickening to see those called Abraham Lincoln think Lincoln freed us. And we have to have a real conversation about that. But they're called Abraham Lincoln. You can't count the chains. You know, the Fidels, the queen that the Queen of Santa was in the United States than we do in Ghana. You know, whole, as I said earlier, the sociology of the names we choose, you know, the generational name. We're talking about the one kid. We're talking about masses of numbers of kids. He went to vote for Uriah Butler. His philosophical conscience was awakened was that night. They left him out of the polling space so they'd come back 12 years later. Well, 12 years later, he was in sitting in jail in Mississippi, struggling for the right to travel on buses. He was struggling you know, for the right to build, to, to vote, because African people in the southern part of the United States could not vote, would be killed, would be thrown off the plantation. And there's a student nonviolent coordinating committee, the students of that era, who broke that issue. <coughs> they were not the first. The Communist Party USA with Harry Haywood and a whole bunch of them fought to force make people where you were born. The NAACP fought for it. The Universal Negro Improvement Association under Marcus Garvey. We don't know our history. So they weren't the first, but they came at the right time. At the right time. You know, in terms of the consciousness of the people, in terms of the objective and subjective conditions. And they broke it. They broke that system. And we're still counting the victims. Not just the victims who was killed, but the babies who were born. Because the woman or the man were killed. Not just the people who were thrown in jail, but the people who were walking around tonight with post-traumatic stress onto an international course. You know, six months later, Kwame rolled back into the United States. The fourth litter of Panthers started in February 1968 at the Free Huey rally. At that point in time, there was only two chapters loyal to Oakland because all these other structures, Bobby Sykes down in Australia, the Dalits in India were a little bit later. I mean, it was yeah, Black Panthers in Barbados, in the Caribbean. It was everywhere. And they were all independent structures. They were not monolithically one party. Well, at the, at the, at the Free Human Rally in 68, you know, it is from that moment that the Huey P. Newton faction of the party began to grow. By September, there were 20 chapters across the United States. That faction 
and we built 16 of them. I founded the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party. I appointed Fred Hampton the chairman of the party. If he had listened to me, then he would be alive tonight. I appointed Bob Rush. And if he had listened to me, he wouldn't be a damn congressman for the Democratic Party tonight. How can you be a congressman and a vice chairman of the party that killed Fred Hampton, killed Mark Clark, tried to kill us? He said, I changed. <laughs> told him, no, you didn't. No way a chihuahua can grow up to be a pit bull. No, you didn't. You just grew up. You were the most conservative element then, and you're the most conservative element now. And we haven't spoken for 20 years. We walked out the door. We built the Panther Party. When I walked into the Panther office one day, and Fred Hampton was giving a press release, press conference in the National Guardian newspaper, and he said he used to be a nationalist. But Oakland had convinced him the errors of his way, and he abandoned nationalism, and he now declared himself a Marxist Leninist, and looked at me and smirked. I just walked past him, went to the telephone, called Ishmael Flory, head of the Communist Party, USA, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, and Wisconsin, and say, Ish, you won. Ish had been trying to recruit me for years. I should have took them down plane tickets to Russia, but he could have kept the Russian women. And one night, just that cold. I made a mistake. I should have took them tickets. I called Ish and said, Ish, you won. You were trying to make us, you know, you one of the youth wings of your party. You succeeded. Now, would you please send somebody over to teach them how to spell Marx and Lenin? <laughs> and teach them what it means. You can't take a gangster off the street and in 24 hours make no Marx and Leninists out. Make no Maoist out of them. I mean, that just does not happen. If they can want to be, they can want to be, they can aspire to be. There's history. We made one fatal, perhaps, mistake. We made history, but we didn't write it. We permitted our competitors and our enemies to have the last and the only word. Dr. Joe Street, who teaches up in Northumbria, who is arguably the <coughs> expert in England, academic expert, on uh, Afro-American history, Afro-American culture, SNCC, the student movement, and the Panther Party. He says that the Panther history has reached its golden age, but it is contested ground. We argue that, that the history of the 60s, the history of the 70s, on up to today, the history of SNCC, the history of the Panther Party is contested ground. And we, who have been silent for 50 years, have made a pact. We're going to contest that history and rewrite that history before we close our eyes. We are looking for help. We are looking for allies in every corner of the world. This is one reason why we came here to Nottingham. And we, again, we will always be for grateful for the, the courtesy, the respect, and the honor <coughs> of your coming here to hear these few words that we have to say. Did I do it? Thank you. Thank you.
Do you want to shout it? Maybe, yeah. All right, come on. Um, the question I have to ask, um, I find your, I find your uh, what you just said is very, very interesting. And coming from an Irish background, and a bit of sense, looking at the Irish struggle and the, and the, the history of the Black Panther movement, um, very, very similar in struggles. But one of the things that, um, um, what was it Howard Zinn once said, like, People like people write book. People write history is usually the bourgeois history, and I like what you said about uh, how I, I've only re I've read Freedom, um, what you call it, Mumia Abu Jamal's book on uh, we want we want freedom. But one thing that comes to mind, and that is, how do we educate our youth in regards to our own histories? And I mean, working class histories, not bourgeois colonial history. Uh, because I think that's a very imperative uh, and very important question. And how do we organise our youth in order to start, <coughs> uh, um, if this sounds correct, to be erect towards, you know, standing against our oppressors? Yeah. To try to answer quickly, I think, first of all, it's an issue of power. Mm -hmm. I think you can only attempt to educate, educate our youth until we have the power to educate them. We do the best we can, but, but we have to see the power to do it. That's what we want. So uh, we can go on and on about how, quickly on what. The history of Irish and African people struggle didn't start with the Panther Party. Mm -hmm. So let's start at the beginning, not halfway through the middle. Frederick Douglass came over here yeah. to get support, you know, for the African movement to abolish slavery. The Irish in the United States were split between those who were Irish slaveholders and those who fought for the abolition of slavery. Mm -hmm. You know, because the first general act of abolition was as a result of the Irish struggle with St. Patrick, mm -hmm. who not only struggled to free to Catholicize Ireland, he also fought to eliminate the slave trade mm -hmm. and the slavery of Irish people by the Vikings. I saw the sign up there said two Vikings. <coughs> two Viking caves in Nottingham and, and the Doomsday Book of 1086. So we need to talk about it. You know, why the struggle of Irish people to eliminate piracy, eliminate kidnapping, eliminate colonialism, eliminate the trafficking in human beings, which they call the slave trade. It ain't no trade, it's war. Yeah. You know, so we need to learn from the Irish people in that struggle. And we need to see the positive of it all the way up to and continuing today. We also need to see the negative. Yeah. In the island of Montserrat, Kwame Ture's mother, paternal side was the biggest, richest Irish slaveholder mm -hmm. in Montserrat. You know, many of those slaveholders who claimed to be British <coughs> were really Scots and Irish. The Scots controlled the tobacco trade when tobacco was queen in the United States long before cotton came online. And when, uh, you know, I mean, I'm born and raised in Chicago. I mean, more Irish in Chicago than it is in Derry. Than it is in Dublin. You know, so I'm just saying we, we share a common struggle. We also share a common blood. You know, there have been good things done and bad things done, and we need to admit it. And then the most progressive forces need to move forward. But if that Devlin came to the United States on 67, 68, before there really was a Panther Party, she was known as the black stuff like Carl Michael and vice versa. The last one, I mean, during the height of the busing struggles in Boston, you know, Kwame and a brother from the Nation of Islam you know, went to a program that Bernard Lee was speaking at, and it was all Irish men, and all of them was drunk. You know, when they walked in the door, and Kwame walks in, and they call it nigga, 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 the nation of Islam down there ran. You know, they go regard them, but they said, oh, he, Kwame's in our road. You know, and Bernadette Devlin cussed all of them out and said, Kwame Ture is more of a brother to me than y'all are. Now, those little tidbits, are not in the history. You know, we haven't spoken to Bernadette in 50 years, partly because the people who did keep decided that we weren't good allies 
and certain factions in the Panther Party was. We never said nothing. Go with them. You know, we give you permission to work with our enemies. You know, we may not work with yours. That's a choice each side makes. Yeah, so we're going back to, we're going to Bloody Sunday. I've been to Bloody Sunday at least four times. And we're going back for the fifth one on 2019 and 30. Definitely see you next Yeah, we just keep trying. Absolutely. You know, so. Any other questions? Thanks. You said it's Red Hat to the list of then you should sure. be alive. There, there, were, there were power struggles inside the organization. I appointed the first central committee of the Panther Party in Illinois because Kwame asked me. I didn't really want to do that. I knew the differences between us before we walked in the door. But Kwame told me, shut up and go do it. And when I rolled back in, I made two phone calls, said, now Panthers, and six hours later, I was in federal lockup for draft resistance and whatnot. But they were power struggles. Different political and economic forces and the police, you know, infiltrated in order to take control or crush it. Part of the struggle was over who would control the Central Committee of the body. And they methodically pushed our people out. You know, well, okay, we weren't we weren't territorial, we weren't possessive. You know, the brother who we appointed to be the treasurer, he makes his speech, puts a five dollar bill on the desk, and said, if the money I'm going to the bathroom, if the money is gone, I know something is wrong and I'm gone. He went to the bathroom, came out, the money was gone. And he didn't wait too long afterwards. So what happened is that when, when the FBI informant O'Neill came in the door, November 1, you know, he worked hard. He worked extremely hard to ingratiate himself in the midst. But he was working for the FBI. And it was a power struggle and we already had a chief of security named Bear, and Fred wanted his chief of security and he won the vote. And I felt busted, you know, no. We don't want this man. We don't know he we didn't know if he was police, but we damn sure know he was crazy. Everybody know that. And we didn't know who he was. The kind of adventuristic and provocative <coughs> kinds of things he was doing in the office. But for whatever reasons, they voted to make him the chief of staff and Fred Hampton's bodyguard. And he came to me and said, I'm your bodyguard too. And I told him, hell no, you're not. My mother and father had 13 kids. We came down the room alone. <laughs> and we're leaving here in the casket alone. And not having to watch our back. Well, that's like December 68. Twelve months later, Fred Hampton is dead and he sets up the raid. Now, it's a mistake. You know, we were 20 years old. You know, it's a mistake. Fred Hampton paid for his mistake. And if he listened to me, he might be alive today. Okay. Yeah, your question. Uh, in, in the United States, uh, in terms of Chicago, Chicago, where um, we know, I know that Panther Party is very strong in Chicago. Uh, what are the Panther Party doing to secure young black male, to attract young black male to the organization? The, the Panther Party is not in existence nowhere in the world. There are books, there are films, there are dead men's pictures hanging on museum walls because of the struggle to take control of our archives. You know, and write the histories and the films. The Panther Party does not exist today anywhere in the world. Why is that? Because it was crushed. It was crushed. Okay. Thanks, you know, it, when they killed Fred Hampton, they were dead. It just took a while to be buried. You know, it's, I mean, we can do later, you know, but it's, it doesn't exist. The idea, everywhere you go in the world, you meet some young kid, especially a young man, who says, I want to be a Panther. 
And he wants to do what the panther did. But the panther did the panther told him what they did and exaggerated. But they didn't tell him how. Don't tell me what you did, tell me how you did it. So if I want to do it, then I can know what you did, what you didn't do, what you could do, the mistakes you made, and then I can move on. So if I don't know, no, no, they don't exist. Can we just hold that question, hold that thought? We're going to have an open, an open question area, okay, which will come, sorry, which will come after we've um, gone through the other speakers. So we're going to probably have about 30 to 40 minutes where hopefully we can hold on to that, that thought. We'll be able to come back to you, okay? Um, thank you very much, Bob. Much appreciated, and also for those questions. Um, I wanted to introduce um, Brother Mawali here. He wanted to speak a little bit about the uh, British state and the uh, and the UK drug trade and its uh, very very visible attack over a long period of time on the African communities here in Britain. Okay, so this problem. Um, let, let me try speaking without the mic if I, if I can. Yes, you okay. yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So I'll just try to speak about that. Let me just say very quickly, well, warmest greetings to everyone. That's the first thing. Greetings to you all. Yeah. Um, very quickly, before there was a CIA, there was an FBI. And before there was an FBI, there was a BI, Bureau of Investigation. And uh, declassified papers uh, show that the BI, the Bureau of Investigation, was investigating Marcus Garvey and the UNIA. Uh, you know, they had spies in his camp, etc., etc., etc. And one of those declassified papers said that Garvey and the UNIA had developed a, a, an alliance with the Irish laborers on the docks. And Garvey had bought some ships, and he had made a pact with the Irish workers on the docks that they would load the ammunition onto the ships, and that the, that the ships would then sail to Africa, where those guns would be used for the physical liberation of Africa. This is what the Bureau of Investigation said. I'm just giving this as an example in relation to one of the questions uh, that, that were put. We don't know whether they were right or wrong, <laughs> but we do have a book of quotes there where we hear the militant, the militant side of Garvey, where he does talk about bloodshed and fighting uh, to the death. But the subject that I'm going to speak on very quickly, I'm a member of the Pan-African Society Community Forum, <coughs> uh, and one of the areas that we've come on under considerable attack for is um, the, the just statements that we've made in relation to the drug trade, the British state's internal war against African people. It's against other oppressed people too, uh, but it really is targeted against African people. Uh, and one of the analyses that we share, uh, I mean, we've, pro we've produced literature on this, which hopefully we can make available at some other point. So I'm just going to try and give a very top level kind of analysis. <laughs> If you think of um, the, the capitalist system, the capitalist inside the capitalist system, um, if you try to steal from a capitalist, um, they've got a system in place for you. They've got police. The job of the police is to arrest you for daring to steal from the capitalist. Um, then they've got a court system where they put you through a process which is made to look like a just trial. And then after that they lock you up or do whatever it is they do for probation. They have all kinds of different things that they, that they do to you. Uh, and this is based on the premise that capitalism says that what the capitalist is doing is legal. So if you're a legal capitalist, according to capitalism, um, there's a system in place to protect your property. Of course, capitalism is about protecting private property. But what happens if you are what capitalism 
treats as an illegal capitalist. You know, there's a secret arms trade, there's the drug economy, there's the smuggling of diamonds and all kinds. There are all kinds of illegal activities according to capitalism. Yeah. Uh, but one of those is the drug economy. If you go and try to steal the property of a drug baron and you succeed, the drug baron cannot go to the police and say, excuse me, that person over there stole <laughs> my property. It's a contradiction which is too great for the capitalist system to bear. So the capitalist system has to set up a, 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 a different chain of events to deal with those that dare to steal from their so-called illegal capitalists. Uh, and so one of the things um, that, that they do is they have the official police force. And inside the official police force, they have a secret police force. In Scotland Yard, that secret police force is called SO10. They have SO10 and SO11. Used to stand for Special Operations. And then when we expose that, they change it to CO, <laughs> Covert Operations. <laughs> so they, you know, when they get exposed, they change their, they change their name so that nobody knows what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah? So I don't know right now whether they're calling themselves SO10 and SO11 or CO10 or CO11, but they call their gunmen. It used to be SO19, Special Operations 19, the government that go around killing us in the street. Uh, now they call them CO19, Covert Operations 19. We know that because they killed so many people that they couldn't keep that secret. Uh, so, so you have the official police who have within them the secret police. And then the secret police have a group of what I'll call undercover secret police. So there, there are three tiers of police. Yeah? Those undercover secret police are the informers drawn from our community. Yeah? They are the enforcers, the ones that go around you know, giving out the, 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 the injuries, <laughs> etc. Defending, uh, physically defending the quote unquote illegal uh, capitalists. Uh, and basically reaping havoc on our community. Now, those of you that are old enough know about this from the 1990s. There was a guy, what was his name? Eaton Green. Does anybody remember that name, Eaton Green? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Eaton. Oh, really? Yes, yes. Ten times, ten times. Ten times. Yes. You know better than me. Yeah. Yeah? You know better than me. They're all informers. E e Eaton Green. Well, what, what Scotland Yard did is they went and got the baddest of the baddest <coughs> bad men from Jamaica and brought them over here to police the drug economy. Yeah. They were not just in, 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 informers to get people caught <laughs> and criminalized. They were actually enforcers. They came all the way from Jamaica over to here, and when they got here, they had guns. If you, if you read a book called The Infiltrators, written by two African police officers, Philip Etienne and Bernard Maynard, from memory, that's their name, the book is called The Infiltrators, you'll see that they admit to doing gun deals inside that book. They admit to chaperoning these drug, these drug enforcers into our community, taking them to the clubs where we rave <laughs> and enjoy ourselves, etc., so that they could familiarize ourselves sufficient, themselves sufficiently with our community in order to carry out their police duties. They were, they were Scotland Yardies. You remember the term the yard used, to, yard used to be used? They were really Scotland Yardies. They were on the police payroll. Yeah? They were, one of them, when he arrived here, they put him up in a Mayfair Hotel, Park Lane. You know, on the Monopoly board, <laughs> the most expensive part. Part Lane, you know. Part Lane, they put him up. Yeah? And he complained. He said it wasn't good enough. And so then they took him, and if you know London, they took him and they gave him a penthouse suite in the Docklands. <laughs> yeah? Because he complained it wasn't good enough. And then he decided that he wanted to have, um, he, 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 taxi's not good enough, he wants a car. 
They went and bought him cash, <laughs> yeah, a, a, a Golf GTI for what they called, the police called his runaround. Yeah? So the, their enforcement role was, was serious, but what this man actually did, Ethan Green, who was one of them, he came to a party here in Nottingham, right here in Nottingham. And, and said, and as, uh, as it's been pointed out by those of you who know him better than me, what happened? And, and he came into the party with his posse, uh, what was the name of the posse? Does anybody remember? Shoot and destroy. Shoot and destroy posse, they call them. So, so, just some madness. And literally shot up the party. <laughs> yeah? yeah. And then when one brother did to, to you know, just remonstrate with them, said, what do you think you're doing? They actually shot the brother. And then whilst he's on the floor, they hurled obscenities at him. They cursed him and hurled obscenities at him. Uh, uh, whilst he's literally on the floor facing death. Now, why, why do I mention this? Because the policing of the drug economy is actually a, a, a mechanism that is used to criminalize our youth. Actively criminalize our youth. They, they, you see, the other role that they were performing was they were training our youth into how to move from beyond knives to guns. Yeah? How to get involved in the drug economy. You know, you know something? If you if I if there are two people with a gun. Okay. If there are two people with a gun, and if I've got a gun in my hand and you know that I'm a killer. And I point my gun at you and you've got, you've got a gun in your hand. Are you going to wait for me to shoot? This is the kind of environment that was created. And we saw a proliferation in the deaths of our people. All of this was around the, the induced drug economy in our community, which was not there before. As we were rising to put a, a point of consciousness, a, a point where uh, you know, there was potential for us to develop effective organization, the drugs were induced mm. into our community. What do the drugs do? They corrupt us in a whole heap of different ways. Of course, it criminalizes our youth. But it even does things, when people get addicted, there are all the health implications. I won't go through all the health implications, physical and mental health. Mm. Prostitution for addicts. If you've got nothing else to sell and you're not prepared to steal, you've got your body. Women and men went into prostitution as a result of induced uh, drug, uh, uh, dr drug addiction. Gangs, so-called gangs, the whole thing proliferated. I'm not saying that they didn't exist before, but the whole thing proliferated and moved to a higher level of, uh, of violence and danger as a result of the induced uh, the, the, the drug economy. Uh, I'm talking about particularly the cocaine uh, drug economy, which was thrust uh, on, on to our children. And I think all I'm saying here at this time, because we can't go into any detail, we've got plenty of detail, but I can't go into the detail here, it is to say that a point that's been reached where some people are trying to defend the, the drug economy as though it's something good because it can be used to rake in money. It brings in a, 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 an economy, an underground economy. Uh, from which people can at least appear to survive. Uh, and so this notion of the drug economy being good, we're suggesting in the Pan-African society, you've got to make it clear that the drug economy is bad. Mm -hmm. It's against the interest of our people. It's against the interest of, uh, I would say, most working people are certainly all oppressed, all, all oppressed people. It's against our interest. And we must develop a campaign to make that point clearly aired across the African community and other communities that are interested as well. I'll stop there because I think my, my, my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've got five minutes for any questions specifically pertaining to what Brother Omwali just shared. Yes. Yeah, um, when, when, when you talk about drugs, 
we see drugs as people drugging on the street. But when the white man is dealing with drugs, he's dealing with drugs to move money from one continent to the next continent. Mm -hmm. So the white man goes to Africa and steals diamonds and sells them and he makes 10 million pounds. If he brings 10 million pounds back here, the government is taking 7 million tax. <coughs> And he doesn't want seven million pounds to go missing. And he can't bring it back because the dogs are going to smell it at the African eat well. So you know, somebody says to him, buy some pork. You don't have to spend half a million pounds on it. And you can make that, if you even lose, if you even lose three or four shipments out of what you bought, you will get your 10 million pounds in the UK. So whereas for the poor man, Drugs is a hustling. You must remember for the man who's out there making big money, it's how he moves money around the world under the eyes and the radar of the tax man. So we're looking at two different scenarios. We don't want it in our community because it's destroying us. Mm -hmm. But remember, even when we stop it, they're still going to be doing it because all we are now is a distraction in a very big industry. Yeah, because we have someone, you know, a man's going to send a key of coke and two keys here and you're going to dribble five keys. And then in 1992, when you're talking about when Manchester police caught the man bringing in the drugs from right. on a small, on a lightweight plane. That's right. Yeah, one and a half tons right. of cocaine in the plane. That's right. And the, and the custom officer said, what are you doing? He said, it's a sting. And when he said, do I have a phone call, he phoned the chief of Manchester Police. That's right. Manchester That's right. Police came and said, let him go. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That was done. That was replicated yeah. all over this country. That's correct. Right? That's so correct. you can see all these small airports with mm -hmm. one and a half tons of coke coming in mm -hmm. in 1992. How mm -hmm. much tons of coke you got? 20, 30 tons of it. That's mm -hmm. why our community mm -hmm. was destroyed in the 90s. Yeah, that's coke. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And that's what they used to destroy you. That's what they used to destroy the Black Panther Party too. Crime. That's right. Yeah? Yeah. They put drugs mm -hmm. in, in, in people's hands. You know what I mean? The espionage side of what man and man never do. But to get the small man yeah. destroyed them put drugs, cocaine and heroin in his way. You know what I mean? And destroy everybody. So thank you. Thank you. So What's the name of the book? Yeah, yeah, one second. There, there, are, oh, yeah, yeah, there are a whole heap of different books. The book that I specifically mentioned was called The Infiltrators. It's written by two dotty beasts, African police, <laughs> yeah, who were the enemies of our people working in the secret police service known as SO10. And their job was to introduce the gunmen into the community introduced them to our, to our sisters. One of them, who, who, was, um, uh, uh, who, who was suspected of the <coughs> rapes and murders of seven different women in Jamaica, was brought over here. And of course, what is he going to do when he gets over here? But rape and murder the African women here. Marcia Laws, at the age of 23, was raped and murdered by this genocidal maniac. This man stabbed her so many times they couldn't even count how many times she was stabbed. You know, these were the kinds of lunatics that they were bringing in to, 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 to our community. Uh, and all, all I'm saying is, we must not be silent on this issue. Yeah, we must speak up, and we're frightened to speak up because there's gunmen in the background. You understand? But we must speak up. They can't shoot us all. We must speak up and we must say that it's wrong. Even if we don't have the force to stop them, we must at least have the courage to stand up and say, this is wrong. And if we say that as a collective, I, th I think we will shift the environment. We will actually shift the environment. We must stand up and say that it's wrong. And, and from what our brother was, uh, was saying there, you, you know, the example he gave is absolutely correct. We've got the documented evidence. Yeah? We've got the documented evidence to prove that what the brother was saying was true. P.C. Donald Palumbo is his name. Yeah? If you, there, there, there are two books by the name of um, Ben Coppers. Two books with the same name. 
But in one of them, it says PC Dondono Palombo was driving an articulated lorry full of ganja, okay, into the country. He was driving, driving it into the country, and um, he, he got stopped at the borders. And, you know, he was supposed to be getting a free pass. Somebody didn't read the script. And they eventually locked him up for, for 10 years. The truth is that he upset somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in the background, so they make a bit more. But the point is that it is organized at state level. The police are just the managers. Yeah? So the capitalists have got the state mechanism backing them. Just as they organize the state mechanism to police the drug, the drug economy. It's a big battle. It may be a dangerous battle. What we are saying at this stage is that we must not remain silent on it. I was on a train last night coming to Nottingham and there were two young <coughs> African men. They look as though they were probably about in their early 20s. And I could smell the... It's not the, it's not, it's not the, the, the high-grade ganja that we used to know when we were children. They got some kind of nasty, nasty... It's really nasty. Yeah? And I could smell it on the two brothers, these two young brothers. You know, they've got our children into this kind of variation of the, uh, of the ganja. It's a variation that turns them fool, yeah. sends them into mental institutions. You know, how can you organize a revolution <laughs> when your soldiers are out of their minds? <laughs> you can't do it. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. I'll have to hold those questions until, again, until we, we, we close. We're going to bring Seamus in now. And, and Seamus is going to talk to us about some of the lessons which we're going to take from the Black Panther Party and its legacy, and maybe how we can look at organising here in Nottingham uh, where those opportunities might be. Okay, thanks, Seamus. Do you want to talk about it? No, I know, I think I'll just shout. Uh, just shout. <coughs> if anybody can't hear me, just say it all there. Yeah, so I did have a little sort of introductory spiel put together, but I don't think I can say anything as powerful as either what Bob or what Amwali has said. So I think I'm just going to sort of jump in. And I am going to start with uh, something very important that uh, Karl Marx once said. Um, it's one of the most famous things that he ever said. And it was, the philosophers so far have only interpreted... Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So what Karl Marx said quite famously is, the philosophers so far have only interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. And so that is the point that I'm starting from today. I'm look, I've looked at the Black Panther Party as kind of a jumping off point to draw some lessons from them that we can apply to organisation and action in Britain and in Nottingham specifically. Um, so for me, for reasons that should become clear, um, and I think probably are clear to a lot of people in this room, what that means is the question of how do we build an anti-imperialist movement? Because that's the key thing that needs to be built. So the first lesson that I think is key from the Black Panthers in this area is the need for organisation. So I recently read um, Kwame Ture's autobiography, which I know Bob has his issues with, but this section um, in the autobiography um, Kwame talks about what he sees as the greatest enemy of oppressed people, and he's speaking specifically about African people, but I think it applies to the working class in general, oppressed people around the world, and he said that that greatest enemy is a lack of effective organisation, and he says that what we need is not ad hoc mobilisations, but permanent, effective, systematic organisation. And my view of the Black Panther Party is that it has such a lasting legacy partially because of that disciplined organisation. Part of the reason that they were able to do things that means that we've heard about them, you know, with the issues that of course Bob has raised, is that they, they were disciplined in doing what they needed to do. So if we take the community programmes, these were only possible because of principled and disciplined organisation. Thousands of people across, you know, the USA, which is effectively a continent, were feeding thousands of children every morning breakfast. They were driving ambulances, you know, they were staffing medical clinics, driving buses to prison visits, and all of this stuff. And these kind of activities are just not possible on the kind of ad hoc basis of kind of, I'll do it if I feel like it. 
It requires disciplined organisation, you know, working to try and achieve something, relying on your comrades, building something in that sense of organisation. Um, so, you know, within the party there was a structure that meant that this organised, disciplined people could act collectively in line with a broader strategy, thinking about what they were trying to achieve and organising to try and achieve it. And without this kind of organisation, and I think the history of the last few decades have shown this, we are left flailing around, reacting as events hit us, rather than being prepared, with roots in the community and in an organisation which gives us a base from which we can act and from which we can build. Um, so I think, you know, the Panthers kind of show us uh, that organisation is what we need. Um, so the question then becomes what for and what against? Um, and from the communist perspective, which is the perspective that I'm working from here, one of the most important political points that we can take forward in Britain today that was made by the Panthers is that there is an objective basis for an alliance between oppressed people around the world and the working class in the imperialist countries. So this is a position that the RCG has in common with Black Panther Party kind of uh, members, uh, the Black Panther Party as an organisation, and other US groups like the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, and other organisations around the world have taken this view. Um, so, you know, Bobby Seale is famous for saying that we don't hate white people, we hate the oppressor. And if the oppressor happens to be white, then we hate it. The Rainbow Coalition, which was organised in Illinois, which I'm sure Bob could, could talk about, um, was organised between these di different groups, like the Young Lords, who were a Puerto Rican group, um, the Panthers, and then white hillbilly kind of Appalachian people, uh, such as the Patriot Party. Um, you know, and, and I watched a really interesting video recently, which was where people from the Panthers travelled out into the rural kind of neighbourhood where these whites were living, and there's this really powerful video where you've got this organiser from the, from the panel, I don't know who he is, um, he's saying to these rural whites, look, you've got rats in your houses, we've got rats in our apartments. The police come around here beating up your children, the police come around where we are beating up our children. We have a basis on which we can work together. And so that is a really key point. Uh, and you know, the Panthers extended that to the global anti-imperialist struggle. So they made links with the struggle of the Vietnamese. So you remember when Bob said, you know, we don't just want peace, we want peace, which is a victory by the Vietnamese struggle. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of link. Um, you know, and this is a point that the RCG comrades are making constantly when we speak to people on the streets. The point that we make is that the very same people who are driving the exploitation, the oppression, the war in oppressed nations such as African nations are the ones who are decimating services and driving down the living standards of the working class within the imperialist countries. It is the British banks, the British companies and their defender, the British state. And so we have that same enemy and so we have a basis, an ally. Um, so yeah, this, this common enemy is the ruling class of the imperialist countries, along with their agents and their lackeys who work for them. And it's in the long-term interest of all oppressed people to ally against this global imperialist power, along with the other imperialist powers. So, the way we view imperialism, which is quite important for understanding you know, why we, we put this view of imperialism across, is that you've got a situation in the world today where there are a handful of rich countries that don't really produce anything. So if you look at Britain today, we don't produce anything. You know, our balance of trade is ridiculous. We, we import all of these luxury goods, all of these things that surround us today, yet we don't manufacture anything. And how do we fund this? The answer is that British banks export huge amounts of finance capital, which is invested in the oppressed nations. This investment means that the control of all the resources on the African continent is in the hands of European banks, European companies, North American companies. Okay, so at the moment, um, British foreign assets, which are mostly finance capital, are five and a half times Britain's GDP. GDP being the measure of the value of all goods and services in the country. Okay? And what this means practically, if you look at the situation in the world, is, uh, for example, you can look at... So last year, War of One, in the summer, <laughs> brought out a new report about the activities of some of these companies. And they looked at 99 London Stock Exchange listed companies. And these 99 companies own $1 trillion of resources in Africa. Okay? And 
all of this wealth from the world's most minimal rich continent. Because if Africa was independent, run by Africans, it would be the world's richest continent because it has all of the natural resources. All of this profit, which should be used, should be being used to build up the African continent, to you know, build up the living standards of African people, to liberate Africans, is not. It's being used to build this nonsense that you see in the imperialist countries. Um, you know, and I think actually what Anwali was saying, there's an interesting aspect to this as well, because obviously this stuff is all defended by imperialist war by imperialist intervention through proxies or directly to control all of this plunder. And one of the ways that all this is kind of controlled is globally the drug trade. So if you think about it, you have recently, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, the Afghanistan war. You speak to people who've come back from Afghanistan, what do they say they were sent back to? To guard poppy fields. That heroin is then sold globally. What happens to the money, the profit from that drug trade? It gets laundered by HSBC. Right, and you can look this stuff up. That's HSBC. Right. Yep. It's a book called Don't Be Incorporated. Yeah. It's all in there. And this is a kind of linchpin of where a lot of this a lot of this capital from the drug trade, which of course is illegal, ends up in the legitimate finance capital, which is then reinvested into the exploitation of Africa. Um, so this is obviously an important realisation, but what's important you know, why the RCG argues that this is so key is that it's key for the movement in Britain. Because it has this fact, this fact that Britain is a parasite, and this fact that we leech all of the value, most of the value, pretty much all of it, from the rest of the world, creates a particular political situation in Britain. And that situation is that these massive super profits allow the ruling class in Britain to buy off a privileged section of the working class. And that section we call the labour aristocracy. So this is something that James Connolly talked about in the Irish story. This is something that Lenin talked about. It goes right back to Marx and Engels, and it goes right back even further than that. It used to be a commonly accepted thing that there was a privileged section of the working class. Um, and under imperialism, this group's power and privilege is entirely dependent on maintaining the imperialist system. And so what does their key priority become? Their key priority um, becomes to work within the working class movement to undermine any effect of resistance to imperialism. Their role is to steer the movement away from attacking imperialism <laughs> and tie it into supporting the pro-imperialist Labour Party, the pro-imperialist trade unions. You know, and this section has demonstrated its treachery again and again in British history. So, you know, if you look at the 1970s and 1980s, while claiming to support the Irish Republican struggle, all of these so-called socialists campaigned for the re-election of the Labour government who had sent troops into the occupied North and who had withdrawn special category status from Irish political prisons. While claiming to support the anti-apartheid struggle, these socialists campaigned for the re-election of Labour who, when in office, had maintained and extended trade with the apartheid state. So people, this kind of section of the British left looks to Tony Benn as one of its great heroes, right? This guy is the, the darling of the kind of Labour left, right? Tony Benn negotiated trade deals with apartheid South Africa and with Israel, right? Um, and so the list kind of goes on. There's so many examples of this. And um, you can look at kind of our work in our paper, Fight Racism, Fight Imperialism, which we've got copies of here. Or if you want a much fuller treatment of the history of this section of the British working class and its representation in the Labour Party, you can read our book, Labour, a Party Fit for Imperialism, which we've got copies of at the back. Um, but this section um, kind of emerges whenever independent working class organisation begins to appear. These opportunists will descend and they use every underhand tactic available to divert the struggle away from the critical task of linking racism and exploitation at home with racism and exploitation in the oppressed nations. Um, the last thing they want is, the, is, is that unity that I've been talking about, that solidarity, that basic, you know, building on that basis for, for alliances. That is the last thing they want because it would threaten the imperialist system which throws the crimes down to them that creates their privileges. Um, and so for us then, the key... Oh, shit. The key question becomes, what about the other side of the split in the working class? The majority who don't benefit from imperialism in the long term. Um, and so when we look at this section, um, we see that actually imperialism, as kind of Marx said about, about capitalism, is that it's creating its own grave diggers. 
The imperialist order has actually created more oppressed sections of the working class within its own heartlands. So after World War II, there's loads of profitable work to be done to rebuild and all of these new factories and everything. And so what the British state did is it granted access to Irish, South Asian, Caribbean workers to come and work for the, in the worst jobs for the least pay. And this process now has expanded to include migrants from all over the world. So most recently, you know, there's more African people now, there's more Middle Eastern people now, and particularly Eastern European workers. And this imperialist exploitation, this is imperialist exploitation carried out within the imperialist country. And, and you know, so there's this section in Britain, in the belly of the beast, that doesn't have any interest in maintaining the and <coughs> will actively fight against it. And historically, this is the section of the working class in Britain which has seen the need for principled solidarity with the people of oppressed nations. Um, so, for example, in that Asian youth move, movement in the 80s, you know, these people, British-born kind of second-generation immigrants, supported the IRA, supported the ANC, the, the South African struggle generally. Um, and so, our role, as we see it in the RCG, is to build an independent working-class movement that is based on principled solidarity between the working class in Britain and the people of the oppressed nations. Um, what we've got is an opportunity for any folks who want to direct something directly back to uh, Seamus on what he's just raised. And following that, we'll go straight into a more general kind of conversation. We've got about 20 minutes uh, to actually do that. So if there's anything you've been desperately wanting to say to Bob on the Wiley or Seamus, please do that. Anything that's specifically back to, back to Seamus. Just gentlemen the first and then yourself. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you for our speakers for the rich uh, talk today. Um, my question actually goes probably to Bob, but I have well, touched on what other guys said. I will mean, start where the last speaker said. He said, most of the African resources are used to develop the developed world. She's absolutely right. The question is why are African politicians, governments, allow this to happen? The speaker before him also mentioned the issue that it is among us, there are some who have been used by the police, by the gangsters, drug dealers, etc., to destroy the community, which is absolutely true. But why among us are used as to do this? That's the question. Okay. The question. My question, yeah, let me make it clear. Because I asked you at the very beginning, that question goes to the book. Just remember my question properly, I just want to mention a little bit of history. When I was around 15 years, 16 years, I have, and obviously you could uh, forgive me for my uh, ignorance at that age, <laughs> I had the opportunity to study economics, which I could be the most corrupted bankers now in Africa. <laughs> I could study politics. I could be the most liest politician. I didn't do that. <laughs> There's something which told me to do that. And it's the history, which is the topic of this lecture. I hate its history. I hate its history. Maybe I hate the way it's being taught. Why? Because I couldn't get pushing on the history. It's, it's, uh, he built a, a, a military, conquered a city. He built, destroyed a city. He killed. It's all like that. I couldn't get why I am learning this. I hate its history. So I became an engineer. Okay? Now, the question comes, is there a problem with the way we, and the, my friend there asked the same question, hopefully I can try to put it in a different way. Is there a problem the way we taught our history, or being taught our history? Do we have a problem? Why we feel inferior? And then that is a problem, because now our politicians, are always using this feeling inferior to stay there where they are, to be corrupted. Okay. They always do that. So, why are we feeling inferior? 
should we really change the way our history is being taught? Is there a bright spot of the black history that we will put it as outline and then have this dot blacks in it, which is the slavery, all these things? Why the slavery? Okay. And we've been used is the highlight. Mm -hmm. And what is the brightness? Is that the issue? And that question to Bob, please. <coughs> Are you, Bob, you happy to answer that and incorporate? Well, I mean, I think Bob's more better place to answer yeah. the question. But, you know, in terms of the first bit, I could just say something. You know, in terms of why do these African leaders, you know, in terms of, in terms of why do these African leaders kind of let this happen? And, you know, kind of, don't they care about African history? I know that's not quite how you put it. But I think there's a lot of money going on. There's a lot of this, you know, enormous sums of, of plunder that's going on. And, you know, you, you can buy people off. Um, and, you know, you can buy off revolutionaries. Um, there was something in the South African struggle that was called the London problem, which is where people who had been active in the struggle would come to Britain, they would have a slightly more comfortable life, and people back in South Africa would, would be arguing, oh, you know, there's this London problem that, that people are now not fighting for revolutionary change. And so if you take that and you magnify it to, well, if you help us, you know, profit off of all this oil, we'll give you a cut. And there are always people who are willing to do that. There are always people who will be agents of the ruling class, agents of the oppressor, and, you know, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My, problem, my problem is, while I can agree overall with both presentations, I do have some serious problems with them. And my problems begin with how the problem and the questions are phrased. You know, somebody once asked, asked a young woman, how did you get pregnant? And she told the mother the same way you did. It depends on how you ask the question, what question you were asking. And let me see it from you, because you, you, the question was so long and complex I don't know if I really got the crux of it, but let me see if we can read it. If I can highlight that, okay. the point. The point is, in the way our history, the black history is being taught, okay. it is wrong, so that we felt inferior. And then that impacted in our actions, and that's why we are as we are. Okay. Yes, and I'm convinced it's deliberate. Let, let, let me give you an example. 2001, people went to Durban for the World Conference Against Racism. The compromises among the government were slavery and the slave trade, all crimes against humanity and should have always been so. I blame the reparations movement, and they know it over that, for not asking the right question. If slavery and the slave trade are crimes against humanity today, then the proper question is when, where, how, why did they become crimes against humanity? And you don't start when they became crimes against us. You go back to the beginning. Caesar was kidnapped and enslaved. And when he got free, he killed the kidnappers ruthlessly. It's on the road of law, at least for Caesar. How did it become okay to enslave Europeans with the Roman Greek invasion of Britain? If Irish were, slavery was abolished in 1102, why did Irish participate in the enslavement of Africans in Montserrat, in Barbados, and why wasn't it illegal under British common law? I mean, this is, why did they not raise the question of piracy, especially against the British government? Because everybody in the elementary school, British History 101, you know that John Hawkins was a pirate. Right. 
and sometimes the prophet too. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows that he had a responsibility for colonialism in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. where they had bases for piracy. Whole countries became pirate bases. And everybody knows about the role the British government played in crushing it when they no longer wanted it. Yet everybody knows that John Hawkins stole the first 300 Africans in the so called, who were enslaved in the so called British slave trade. So these are always acts of piracy. And piracy was declared a crime against humanity, the enemy of mankind, centuries ago. So I agree with you quickly that the question is how to phrase the question of black history, you know, so that there can be a proper answer. And, and, and I criticize the forces who control the history and the cultural industrial complex because it is an industry and it is controlled ruthlessly you know, by the syllabus, by the textbooks they choose, by how they credential people with PhDs and whatnot. So let me, let me drop that one. Let me just respond quickly. There's a point in which I'm almost prepared to say, damn Africa being the richest continent in the world. It don't really mean nothing. Yes, Africa got the uranium. If we took control of the uranium tomorrow, what are we going to do with it? Who are we going to sell it to? Do we really need and want nuclear weapons? Do we really need and want nuclear energy? So if you don't sell it, and we recommend they don't sell it, then its value is nothing in the ground. So we need to look at all the minerals. Some of them minerals does not need to be dug from the ground. That's true, John. The anti-nuke movement is preoccupied about a U.S. nuke sitting in Europe but they don't say nothing, nothing about the plight of the Iranian workers. The people who are digging that stuff from the ground, who are suffering and cancer <laughs> and other kinds of issues. So, you know, I mean, who ultimately, who really gives a damn about this wealth, you know, this pollution? Are we going to pollute the world? in order to gain the wealth, and if we do, what are we going to do with it? You know, I mean, I'm just having problems, and, and, and I think it, it's, not, well, it's today. If we don't ask the right questions today, how are we going to change the world any better? And I don't think we're asking them. I certainly don't agree with all the answers. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, we might have kind of gone up as well. Uh, what I do want to say, because it's getting on a little bit now, we've got maybe another 15 20 minutes. So, these gentlemen are going to be traveling uh, around the UK, they've got probably another 20 days to do in 14 15 days. Uh, they're then going to be heading off to, uh, well, certainly Bob's going to be heading off back down to southern Europe. So, I want to encourage people to actually help them finance that by putting something into our collection box, which I'm going to pass around now. Please do whatever you can, and everything will be gratefully, gratefully kind of received. Um, we've also got a few kind of signing kind of sheets as well, so if people are looking at some of these issues and feeling that there is more which they want to look into, and more which they want to explore, then there's something around with the RCG there, there's also something there around Oxford City Monitor and also the PASCF. Please take a moment to have a quick browse, please add your name to it, because one of the things we are looking at doing is to take this idea of the ten point, uh, the ten point principles of the Black Panther Party, 
a 10 point plan and look at each of those and try and find the responses. Are those the questions we need to be asking now? And what are the responses which we need to be finding here in Nottingham to actually address those issues which people are feeling on the ground? So this is actually not just a meeting that we can say, it's a feeling of ideas, but also with the intention of creating action, because it's action which is what we need to take more than anything else now, okay? Um, so yes, I'm going to pass this to this lady here first, and if you send it along the line, so we a very trusting group, so please do what you can, um, and just keep it honest. There, uh, there was a question from this gentleman here, he's waiting very patiently, and this lady here as well, uh, then we'll take another couple after that. Huh? Please, please, don't, don't leave, uh, and we'll just sort of 15, 20 minutes, which we Right, um, I kind of got... I kind of two questions. Um, one to this brother here, one to this brother here. Okay. Right. So the first one I'm going to ask to you, um, regarding that like you're, you're taking lessons from the Panther Party and um, saying how community-based organisation is the way forward. I agree, but as Bob said, the, the Black Panther Party doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. They were crushed. Um, and also something that was said about Africa being the richest continent absolutely is in terms of um, resources. And Colonel Gaddafi was trying to put together a United States of Africa and they made sure that didn't happen. So how is this going to work then? Because if the powers that be could destroy Colonel Gaddafi, how is how is this going to work? That's the problem. Um, what I was going to ask you is, in terms of the youth and the problem with drugs and things like that, do you think it's a, a solution could be, and there should be a movement more, for parents to homeschool, teach their own children now, and stop putting them into the institutions that are making them believe they are inferior? <coughs> And that are making, um, that are helping them to take on roles that society places them in, rather than the roles that they were born for. Thank you. So, so the question basically is about how it looks kind of hopeless because they've got so much power. Effectively, I mean, I would say that you know, um, no, if you'd asked anybody in 1950 in Cuba. So yeah. The question is, how is it going to work in that lot? Really, I don't mean to paraphrase it like that. So, yes, sir. How is it going to work now differently from how it didn't work then? So, what are the specific kind of lessons that we need to learn from? Yeah, more or less. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, I'd say um, one of the key lessons that kind of Bob talks about is um, this, this issue of infiltration, this issue of the agents within the movement, um, you know, how they work against the broader interest of the movement. And I think that it's something that, so, so Kwame Ture actually talks about it where he, he makes his kind of, he takes some issues with the way that the, what Bob would say is kind of the Newton, Bobby Seale kind of Black Panther Party, he talks about how, uh, because there was su such this kind of explosive kind of thing, um, people didn't have the personal bonds of people didn't get a chance to know anybody um, because there was all this massive influx, you know, uncontrolled kind of influx into the party which allowed a lot of infiltrators to get in, for example. So you can you can take something, you know, this is just an example of the top of my head, but you can take something like that and you can kind of control the inflow, you can have, in terms of like a casual organisation, you can have more kind of oversight over how you bring people in and you can kind of take, if possible, a slower kind of uh, Start kind of attack with things and you know various things like that. You need to you know, look at the history, study where mistakes were made, find analogies today, that sort of thing. Yeah, thank you for the question, my, my brother. Um, I think the way that I approach it is to say this: that um, if people decide they want to homeschool their children um, to get them away from the oppressive, misleading type of education 
that is inflicted upon us in this type of society, in Britain certainly and other societies of this kind. Uh, I certainly am not going to say to them, Pan-African society is not going to say to them, um, don't do it. I do have a personal friend, a very good friend of mine, whose children were taken away from her. Um, she was a homeschooler. Uh, her, her children were operating at a genius level <laughs> from her homeschooling. She's a sister with uh, you know, one degree in arts, one degree in science. <laughs> very unusual combination and she was doing her homeschooling and her children were just flourishing and they took her children away from her and the children were then put into schools where they were way above all the other <laughs> students in the school but the state had a vested interest in, in, in uh, attacking and destroying uh, what she was trying to do. Many people who were involved in the whole schooling movement experienced this kind of uh, state interference. <laughs> Uh, and the reason I give that example is to say this, is that in the Pan-African Society Community Forum, we say the collective is superior <coughs> to the individual. This is what we say. We accept that the individual is vital. <laughs> we accept this. We accept that the, co the collective also is vital. We accept this. <coughs> but they're not at the same level. Why are they not at the same level? Because a, 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 a collective, if you put the right collective together, it can create an individual, the right woman and the right man put together, can create an individual. But no individual can create themselves or another individual. This is just nature. That's right. Yeah? This is just the basis of nature. So. so, so if we're going to look for, for solutions, we have to understand that imperialism doesn't organize just at the uh, microscopic level. Imperialism organizes globally, it organizes internationally. And in order to meet that challenge, we at the grassroots have got to organize internationally. When Bob says that he's coming over here for the AAPRPGC to look for allies, <laughs> He's actually organizing on that scale. Notice he didn't say he's coming over here just to look for African people, <laughs> though that is very important. What he's doing, he's trying to network because our enemy <laughs> is networking all over the world. Uh, and if we want a solution to the problem, rather than the kind of quick fix, or the quick fix for my individual family or my individual self, that's not what I meant, by the way. No, okay, I, 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 yeah, I, I take that. It's not yeah, a criticism I mean, of your question. Yeah. I'm just trying to offer an analysis. That, that, that's all. Okay. Yeah? If you want a, a solution to the problem, then it's more about how does homeschooling bec become organized, become institutionalized, so that when the state attacks one homeschooler, it's, a, it, it's got a whole system in place, a whole organization in place to fight the state, to fight the state back. So, so, so uh, we wouldn't necessarily, we're not against the homeschooling, we're not against the homeschooling at the individual level, but we wouldn't see that as, uh, as the level at which the defense uh, of, home, uh, of homeschooling um, you know, should, uh, should be carried out. It really has got to be something more collective and more global. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm the right to that. As somebody who's been a, a home educator, a home school, and my daughter's here tonight, uh, you know, the avoiding the secondary school education is really important in many ways. Um, the ability to actually have space for people to actually form their own ideas mm -hmm. and their own sense of identity is really important. And if there's something which you're interested in doing, Meet me after. I'll tell you exactly how we were able to try and make that work. There are masses of pitfalls, um, but I'm hoping that my daughter and others will be sort of, you know, are the are the are the are the fruit of that, and it has to be for me rooted in some level of political consciousness uh, with uh, with a political ideology, you know, underpinning it. 
or otherwise is like a lot of homeschoolers who just do it for their own religious re re uh, reasons uh, with their rationale just being able to indoctrinate a particular uh, a particular thought or uh, you know, religious kind of belief system and you have to wade through all of that and all of those groups because there's a lot of people inside of all that but um, but there is a way of navigating it and more people are choosing it mm -hmm. so you know it's something which if, it, if you do get the opportunity do explore did I respond? I responded as short as I could to a specific question. Where's the path apart today? I said it was destroyed. We didn't discuss my view on how, why. We ain't had the time. This myth that feeding children is revolutionary is confusion. It's not. It is something that human beings do. <coughs> Animals can go out there and forage for their own food. Our babies cannot. <coughs> this myth that the Panther Party was destroyed because it fed children is a myth. That is not, that is not what made it a threat. That's that is true. not what made it destroyed. You know, so I didn't discuss that because it's, it's very hot. And it's too long, we don't have that. But to suggest that because the Panther Party is destroyed, that y'all can't feed some children today, I don't say that. In fact, I'm even holding back on some of the things I would say because I want to encourage you to try. To try and go feed some children. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's very simple. You do an analysis of who needs to be fed. You figure out how to feed them. It may be put in cooperative grocery stores. How do I have to cook the food if I can help empower the family and teach them that it needs to be done and how to do it? So it's, it's no longer that simple. It is bottom line, an, an economic and social system that provides for people's human needs with this respect food and whatnot. And I mean, if I really wanted to do it, I think we could, and, and I told Rob, I have some conversations and some suggestions. You know, why would we repeat something? I mean, the world has moved on, you know. We don't have to do it the way the Panther Party did it because we got other tools. You know, we, we got technology, we, we got a little bit more building space, you know. We cut deals. In Chicago, we have a problem of housing, we have a problem of jobs, we have a problem of foods, and some of the forces are talking about the need to cut the deal with Mondragon, you know, in Spain, who is the best cooperative and the largest cooperative in the world. Now, I ain't saying we can do it, but they do have a deal in Jackson, Mississippi, you know, that the bass, you know, creed that did with the chopper in the mumbo was for a moment the mayor. So I, I'm, no, it can be done. We can help feed our children today. I'm not sure that we should, if we could, mechanically use the models the Panther Party did that was all they had access to at that point in time, you know. But the capacity in the Educate our youth. Until then, we can only attempt. And we have to, and collective is superior to individual. I completely agree. And I think, um, you know, <coughs> education and, and schools at the moment are their sites for kind of struggle. They always have been. Um, but just one thing I was reminded of by a piece of paper that I got given yesterday at school was um, this, this I, I thought it wouldn't apply to her because she's in reception. The government is now forcing schools to collect data on all, pe on all students to see um, what their country of birth is. Not their language at home, which, you know, theoretically they could help people to, you know, if English was their second language, it could give them additional support, um, not that they do very much. 
but this is about country of origin and they're passing this information onto the Home Office and that information has already been used to round people up for deportation. It's a, it's a, a way of being used to try and like um, get back in contact with so-called illegal migrants. Illegal according to who? This, this system, this imperialist system that's leeching wealth from around the world and they turn around and say that a Libyan family is illegal. I, I call that bullshit, but it's bullshit that needs to be challenged. Me as one parent, I'm going to write to the governors, but what's that going to do? Do you know what I mean? Now they know I'm the radical parent, yeah? I'm still going to do it, but we need to do more than that. And I think, you know, it's so great seeing so many people here. I just hope it's not, I hope it's the start of something. We don't all think the same. We've got different points of view, different perspectives. But I think this idea that's come through from this meeting is about building alliances, about where we can work together, the things that, the things that we can do. And I just really hope that, you know, these meetings that Rob mentioned might be a, a start to continue this discussion because, you know, they're organised, they've got their networks, they've got their CCTV, their police, their everything, and we're not, and we need to be. Objectives of this particular meeting is to find the people who will help feed some children and whatnot. I mean, that's a particular objective. That's the program, the agenda of the organization who help organize this. So we don't want to lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to lose sight of that. And you can do it. You can, where there is a will, you can find a way. And if we can help you in any kind of way, I mean, I've helped more breakfast programs and children's programs since the Panther Party than before. I mean, we roll in and we talk about hundreds of thousands, not ten, because the resources exist. You know, it's a question of the capacity, putting the pieces together to get the capacity. So please, 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 please. Do what you can to help push this program forward. Because we, our people are hungry. Mm -hmm. In a world of plenty. And we just have to do what we can while we try to change the world. We also have to manage some of the crises, some of the problems as best we can. That's cool. Uh, I think, unless you want to have something changed, but I think. One quick thing, yeah, just, 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 just one quick point, and just, just, just to say this, that um, uh, I, I've been very fortunate to be exposed to seniors in the movement um, who have taught me a lot, one of those is Bob, <coughs> uh, who have taught me lots of things, and one of the things that one of these seniors, one of these elders, uh, uh, taught me, um, when I started talking to him, I'm thinking of your point about the you know, cameras and they're, they're being well organized. <coughs> he said to me, there's nothing to worry about. Who mans the cameras? It's the workers. Yeah? No matter how powerful imperialism looks, yeah, in order for it to operate, it requires us. Yeah? We are the real force. We are the real power. And if we understand that, we will bring imperialism down. Mm -hmm. wow. Thank you. It's great that so many of you stayed out so late um, and seem so engaged by the conversation. There should be, hopefully, um, some copies of the 10 point plan. Yeah. Oh, the Panthers are still here. Yeah. What I'm really interested in doing is people taking one of those away with them at least. Because this conversation will be a start for us to be able to look at that 10 point plan, which was a plan which was created of its time. And actually see, is that plan still relevant to us now? Is that of its time now? And for us to then look at which aspects of that we might want to challenge some of our energies collectively into addressing and seeing if there are new ways, new formulations for us to actually challenge, challenge the state and challenge imperialism. So I'm going to say that if people have shared their details, if 
I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. I'd like to thank Bob for his whistle stop tour with uh, Omar Wally for sharing such gems tonight, and also Seamus for you know sharing the position of the RCG, which hopefully has made it really plain for people the benefits of organisation and the work which you're doing because they hit the streets really hard and they make and they do make a difference. Uh, that this is I wouldn't say a start, but this is just more information, more knowledge, and and more stuff to hopefully feed our revolutionary kind of fervour. So I'll close on that. From home, it's a long way. A long way. Slave master, I wanna go home. I wanna go home. Hey, street dedication is where I started me and my brothers. Street dedication, gotta shout out all the black mothers. Street dedication is where I started me and my sisters. Street dedication, gotta shout out all the black fathers.